excited to be in the house of God today, amen? Amen. Hey, what do you think? Our sanctuary is complete. Uh, the, the construction's done. We got the walls painted and knocked down and lights are in the ceiling in those uh, spots that didn't have lighting before. And so it is complete. And we have made room for an extra 50 to 60 chairs in this place. So it's awesome. And something I did just this morning as I was walking around and praying this morning, as I always do before service, um, I, I made an improvement to this section of chairs. You guys... Do you, guys, can you, do you guys notice the improvement I made to this section over here? <laughs> so you're not trapped against the wall anymore. Did you notice you're no longer trapped against the wall? I scooted all the rows out from against the wall. So now, if you are the one who has to get all the way up closest to the wall, before you were kind of like trapped. You had to go use the restroom. You're like, oh, I don't want to have to like crawl over everybody's feet. So... Um, but now you have extra room. You can go on and slide up against the wall and exit if you need to. Um, but hey, who's excited to talk about politics today in church? Come on. It is part two of our series called The Political Sermon. Open your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, a book that you probably don't read all too often. Um, some of you may have never even turned to the book of Ezekiel. You didn't even know there was a book named Ezekiel. Uh, but Ezekiel was a prophet of the Lord, and the Lord gave him this message. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 5, it says, Once again, a message came to me from the Lord. And he said, Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against a country, the people of that land choose one of their own to be a watchman. And when the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Then if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm, but ignored it. And so the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. You know, my role in preaching this sermon series is to serve as a watchman sounding the alarm for what could be coming if we don't take action. Yep. My role is to serve as your pastor, as your shepherd, as your leader, to speak to the church and let the church know that if we as the church, if we as the body of Christ don't take action, if we don't speak up, and if we don't vote, the freedoms that we have long enjoyed may be in jeopardy. The type of country that the United States of America has been historically is on the line. And in part one, I just want to do a quick recap. If you weren't here for part one, here's a quick recap. In part one, we asked the question, what can we do to advance the kingdom of God? What can we do to advance God's kingdom and prevent the rise of evil in our land? What can we do to prevent the further decay of our nation? Here's the few things that I said. Number one, we have to understand that God uses imperfect people. God uses imperfect people. God can use anyone to turn a country around. God can use anyone. God uses flawed, sinful, imperfect people. And so we don't want to simply look at the person, but we want to look at the policies that that person will put in place. And so that leads me to point number two from part one is vote policies over personalities. You don't vote for the personality. You vote for the policies that that leader will put in place. A nation doesn't prosper because of the righteousness of the leader. It prospers because of the righteousness of its policies. It's the policies that bring prosperity to a nation. It's not the leader. It's not the person. It's the laws and policies that they put in place. And number three is voting is not just a right. Voting is the responsibility of every Christian. If you are a Christian, if you are a Christ follower, you don't just have the right to vote, you have the responsibility to vote. If Christians don't take action and vote, evil will continue to take over our land. So the title of my message today is, what's the issue? Turn to your neighbor and ask him, what's the issue? What's the issue? So today we're going to talk about specific issues that should matter to every voting Christian. If you are a Christian, 
We're going to talk today about the issues that should matter to you as a Christ follower and as a child of God and as someone who follows Jesus. So here are seven issues to consider in this election. Number one, the first issue that you must consider that I believe is the most important issue in this current election is religious liberty. Religious liberty. Religious liberty is supposed to be protected under our First Amendment rights. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution protects the following rights. This is what the First Amendment is supposed to protect. Speech, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and the right to petition. Now, again, getting back to what they tried to pull in 2020, they tried to remove our right to assemble in 2020. Bars could be open. Nightclubs could be open. Our governor even said, you know what? Shopping centers can be open before the church is open because people need their uh, shopping, what, what did he call it? Their uh, shopping therapy. But what about the spiritual health of a nation? What about our spiritual health? What about the, the, the spiritual health that all comes when people gather and assemble in the church? Not just spiritual health, but your social health, mental health. And so we saw back in 2020 the attack on our First Amendment. And it has only continued since then. Freedom of speech has been attacked. Freedom of religion. Freedom to practice our own religion as we see fit. Well, I don't think I want to take the vaccine because I don't know what all is in there. And I don't want to put some foreign object in my body. And that is my right as a Christian. But what did they say? Well, if you don't get the injection, you're going to be lose your job. You're going to be fired. You can't come here. You can't work here. You can't go there. So we have seen a continual attack on our First Amendment. And let me just be very, very clear. Depending on who is voted in this next election, that attack on our First Amendment will only continue. But if we vote the right person in, we can defend and protect our First Amendment rights. The fact is we are seeing the First Amendment come under scrutiny. Democrats believe that our First Amendment needs to be revised. They have said this, that the First Amendment needs revisions. It needs to be revised and that speech needs to be policed. We need to, you know, uh, censor and protect what some what some people are saying. We want to censor some of the speech. Uh, they're trying to uh, censor certain information and the spread of information. And as they say, disinformation. But who, of course, is the, the one determining what's misinformation or disinformation? That does not fall in the hands of government. God gave us brains. God gave us the ability to think for ourselves to have dialogue and conversations amongst each other who think differently than us. Some of our religious beliefs, they believe, need to be suppressed and censored. This is already happening on social media. I was censored on social media, which affected our church's live stream from going live. We found a little loophole around there, but for a week... We were like, what happened? Why did we not have the ability to live stream our service? So we need to vote, church, for the candidate that will best defend our constitutional rights. We need to vote for the candidate who we believe will best protect and defend our constitutional rights, especially when it comes to our religious freedoms and religious liberty. In the book of Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, God commands his people saying, you shall have no other gods before me. It is the very first commandment of God that we are to not love and serve any other gods but him. This is the first and most important of God's laws. And we recognize this law in legislation as the conscious clause. 
We actually have a conscious clause written in legislation, which means that if my allegiance is supremely to God, I should not be required to submit to anything or anyone that goes against my conscious or my religious beliefs. This is written in legislation. This is called the conscious clause. We really need to vote for the candidate we believe will best defend the conscience clause and our First Amendment right to religious liberty, religious freedom. This means that Christian doctors who refuse to perform abortions because of their faith won't be fired. They won't lose their medical freedom. They won't lose their medical license. It means Christians who refuse to get vaccinated won't lose their jobs. It means Christian-owned businesses that refuse to provide service based on their religious beliefs won't face penalties. Whether you're a graphic designer and someone says, hey, I'd like you to make me this T-shirt. And you say, I can't make that image. I can't print that image on a T-shirt because it goes against my religious beliefs. You have every right to deny service because it goes against your conscience. Photographers, bakers have the right to refuse service based on their personal conscience. You don't have to agree with their choice. You don't have to agree with their choice to deny service, but we should all agree that they have the right to make that choice and that no one should ever be forced to do something that goes against their personal moral conscience. We should all agree on that. Effective July of 2025. July of 2025, next year, teacher licensing rules passed last year in Minnesota under Democrat Governor Tim Walz will ban practicing Christians, Jews, and Muslims from teaching in public schools. How are they banning them? Well, starting next July, Minnesota agencies will require teacher license applicants to affirm transgenderism and race Marxism. Without a teaching license, individuals cannot work in Minnesota public schools, nor in the private schools that require such licenses. Universities are also affected. Starting in 2025, they must either train their teaching students to fulfill these anti-Christian requirements or be banned from offering state licensing. These regulations require teachers to affirm students' gender identity and sexual orientation in order to receive a Minnesota teaching license. So teachers are going to have to decide, am I going to deny my faith and compromise my faith, or do I want to keep my job? That is the choice that Christian teachers are going to have to make in July of next year. Compromise what I know the Bible teaches. Compromise on what I know my faith tells me is wrong or to keep my job. You can see how our First Amendment rights to free speech and our right to practice our religious freedoms are under attack. They're not keeping it a secret. It's obvious, it's out there for all to see that there is a certain political party that is attacking religious freedom, and freedom of speech. Christian teachers will be forced to either deny the truth of God's word, that there are only two genders, male and female, or lose their teaching license. What's next? Well, let me tell you what's next. If we keep heading in the current direction, they could say that if pastors like me don't affirm or perform gay weddings, we could lose our ministerial license. This is a real possibility, depending on how this next election goes. The second topic that we must consider when voting, number two, is border security. Let me just tell you, God is in favor of secure borders. God is in favor of border security. We see this in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, New Testament. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says, From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. 
and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries. What was that? Ba- boundaries? Yes, God marked out boundaries of their lands. Lands have boundaries. God is not opposed to nations having boundaries and borders and securing and defending those borders. In fact, when he gave the Israelites their promised land, he divided it amongst the 12 tribes of Israel according to specific boundaries and borders. While God is all for national borders and national boundaries and border security, let me also say that he is for immigration. God is for immigration. Joseph and Mary were immigrants. Okay, God is for immigration. He has a heart for the foreigner. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse 10, it tells us, do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. And so we are to care for these people. But when it comes to immigration and foreign policy, let me tell you, there is a right way and a wrong way to enter borders. There is a right and legal and lawful way, and there is the illegal way. As a country, we have border laws that we are supposed to be enforcing to protect the civilians of this nation. We have laws. We're supposed to enforce those laws to to, to ensure our safety and security. Now, I know immigrants, I know of immigrants who have come into our country the legal way. And yes, it was a long process. They had to wait a long time to receive their green card. But right now, we have millions of illegals pouring into our country, overwhelming local governments. They don't know what to do with all these people. They don't have the resources to properly care for and integrate them into our society. Many of them are receiving free health care, free hotels, free cell phones, free credit cards. And for what? Why? All because many believe that the Democratic Party are hoping all these illegals will vote and turn the election in their favor at the expense of our national security. This is the reality, church. This is what's happening. American citizens have been killed because of terrorists and criminals that have been allowed to enter into our country illegally. This is a fact. This has happened. Americans that should still be alive, that would still be alive, had people come in the legal and right and lawful way. But because they were allowed to come in illegally, Our own American civilians have been killed. We must vote. We must secure our national borders. And we must vote for the candidate that we believe will effectively secure our national border. Number three, another topic that needs to matter to all voting Christians, it's Israel. We are pro-Israel. Now let me say, as your pastor, this does not mean that I agree with everything Israel has done. Just like I don't agree with everything America does. (laughs) Certainly, Israel has not been right on everything they have done. Just like America has certainly not been right on everything we have done. But let me be clear Genesis chapter 12, verses three, verse three, Genesis 12, verse three. God makes it clear. He says, I will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who treat Israel with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through Israel. Okay, God is talking about Israel in this verse. And let me be clear that, again, I don't support everything that Israel does. But what I do know is that God says we better be Israel's ally. We better be Israel's ally and not Israel's enemy. God will bless those who bless Israel. 
and he will curse those who treat Israel with contempt. And unfortunately, there's a lot of Americans today that are treating Israel with contempt. We cannot have our politicians cozying up with Israel's enemies. America must stand firm in its support for and of Israel. We must ask ourselves which candidate will best support the nation of Israel. Can I get an amen? amen? Number four, a fourth topic that needs to matter to voting Christians that you need to really consider is judges. Isaiah chapter one, verse 26, it says, then I will give you good judges again and wise counselors like you used to have. Then Jerusalem will again be called the home of justice and the faithful city. Now, God here is telling Isaiah the prophet that when you have good judges, they can help bring righteousness and justice to a nation by virtue of their judging, by virtue of their ruling, by virtue of their decisions. Judges can help bring righteousness and justice to a nation by their decisions. Judges matter. And don't downplay the importance of the president selecting federal judges. In Trump's single term, he appointed 226 federal judges. Both Obama and Bush, in their two terms, two terms, they appointed 334 and 322. In Trump's one term, he elected, he put in place a lot of judges for just one term. Federal judges is an important factor to consider when voting for a president because our Supreme Court justices play a huge role in our nation ruling and judging in righteousness. It's because of the Supreme Court justices that Trump put in place that we were able to overturn Roe v. Wade. Judges matter. So we have to ask, which candidate will appoint the better, more common sense judges that stand for righteousness and justice and again, will defend and preserve our constitution? Judges matter. Number five, this is another important one. Speaking of common sense, number five is biological sex needs to matter in this next election. And I'm not talking about the person we elect and their biological sex. I'm talking about their views of biological sex and the rights of biological women and biological men. In Genesis chapter one, verse 27, Again, God made it plain. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Everyone say male Male. and female. female. Those are the only two genders. Anything else you hear is delusion, confusion, and a lie. There are only two genders. God, the creator of all things, the creator of human beings, makes it very clear how many genders there are, male and female. You are free to choose your identity however you want. That's your personal right. But it's not right to expect everyone else to go along with your delusion. If you want to say you are whatever... That is, your, that is your American right. But it's not right to expect everybody else to play your game. God assigns biological sex in the womb. We don't get to decide what gender we want to be. We don't get to decide what gender we want to be. It doesn't matter how you feel. In this case, I will tell you, feelings don't matter. 
Feelings don't change fact. You can feel like a boy or you can feel like a girl, but God created you either a boy or a girl depending on the parts you have and the DNA that you have, the hormones that you have. It's already been decided. Gender dysphoria is a legitimate type of mental illness. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm saying that as a fact. There is a legitimate mental illness and it is called gender dysphoria. It is a mental illness. And yet we want to pretend that it's not. And when we affirm a man as a woman or a woman as a man, we are contributing to a lie, and we are contributing to furthering their mental illness. This is not hate speech. Even if you hate the speech I'm given, it's not hate speech. It's fact, and it's love. It is love to speak the truth. And rather than contributing to a lie and affirming what someone may feel like. Rather, we should be contributing to the truth that every person is made in God's image. God was not confused when he created us. And we need to celebrate and accept who God created you to be. Men serve a role in society. Women serve a role in society. It was Booker T. Washington who said this. He said, a lie doesn't become truth and wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. Affirming people's gender confusion has led to males competing in female sports, males using female locker rooms and restrooms, and denying females the protections and safe spaces that they deserve. Females no longer have exclusive spaces because any man that chooses to identify in that moment as a woman can walk into their space. Don't tell me you stand for women's rights when you allow men to dominate women's sports, change in women's locker rooms, and nominate men as woman of the year. You are not standing for women's rights if that's what you believe. There are currently 14 states that have transgender health care shield laws. Among them is our state of Minnesota. Our governor, Tim Walls, who's running for vice president, signed into law making Minnesota a trans refuge state. Here's what that means. Here in our state of Minnesota, signed into law by our fantastic governor. (laughs) Here in Minnesota, if a child has been unable to obtain sex change procedures due to one or both parents objecting, the state can obtain temporary jurisdiction over the child allowing them to access gender-affirming care. This is the reality. And and people want to say, oh, the government's not after your kids. That's just hyperbole. No, they are after your kids. They will literally take your kid from your custody if your kid says, I feel like a girl. I want the parts. I want to cut off my, my parts and... And even if one person objects, that means if you have even one parent with common sense and the other parent is woke, the state can still take the child from the parent with common sense. We've seen stories. I've seen the heartbreaking stories. And it is truly heartbreaking. A child can't get a tattoo, but if you want to, you know cut off body parts because at this young age where your brain is still growing, you still don't know what you want. As far as I know, you want to be a dragon when you grow up. But you want to cut off your body parts, that's totally fine. But you want to go get a tattoo. No, 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 you can't get a tattoo. Can't put some ink on your body until you're 18. But if you want to chop off those same body parts, that's okay. It does not make sense. There is no logic to this. They want authority over your kids. There is a particular party that wants to have authority over your kids. They don't trust you to parent your own kids. And so when you vote, 
Make sure you ask yourself which candidate and which party will best protect and defend God's design of biological sex. Can I get an amen? Amen. Which leads me to number six. We're gonna talk about family. Family is an issue that should matter to every voting Christian. And in Psalm chapter 127, verse three, it says that children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Let me tell you, as you already know, based on what I've already shared today, parental rights are slowly being, slowly but, might I say, progressively stripped away from parents. And yes, I use that word intentionally. Parental rights are being slowly but progressively stripped away from parents. Children are being targeted by evil progressive agendas. It's happening in schools with the books that they're reading, the books that they are being told to read. It's happening by the media, with TV, with movies, with music. These are books that children can find in their public schools and in public libraries. The biblical design for family is comprised of a husband and a wife who love each other and the fruit of that love is children. The biblical design for family is under attack. The way God designed family to be is under attack. Progressive liberals claim that marriage is an oppressive institution. Don't get married, it's oppressive. Women are oppressed in marriage. The nuclear family is under attack. Marriage is oppressive. Having kids is stupid and expensive, they say. It is expensive, but it's not stupid. (laughs) And all the parents said amen. (laughs) Not having kids, dare I say this in church, and might I offend some of you, but not having kids as a husband and a wife is a selfish choice. You're free to make that choice. But my opinion is if you are married, God's design for marriage was procreation. God's design for husband and wife were to have the fruit of their love, which is children. It's a gift from God. It's the fruit of that love that is exclusive between a husband and a wife. Children are a gift from God and they are reward. They are a reward from him. Our children are not... They do not belong to the state. That's right. That's right. Our children do not belong to the state. They belong first to God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then God has entrusted us to care for them and raise them and teach them to love God. And when our children truly love God, they will be great, civil- they will be great citizens. That's right. yeah. Great civilians. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the government's responsibility to raise our kids. God gave that responsibility to us as parents. Consider which candidate will best support parents in how they choose to raise their kids. Amen? Amen. My last point today, the last issue that I want to share is the issue of life. This is an issue that must matter to every Christian. God creates life. Life begins in the womb. Proverbs chapter six, verses 16 through 19 tell us seven things that God hates. Seven things that are detestable to him. In Proverbs chapter six, verse 17, he says, God hates hands that kill innocent blood. God hates hands that kill the innocent. And so the question we must ask is which candidate, which political party will best protect the lives of innocent babies? Now here's where I may offend some of you if I haven't already. (laughs) The fact is in this current election, we don't have a truly pro-life candidate on either side. That's the fact. We have one who is more pro-life than the other. 
And that should matter. And that must matter when we vote. But the fact is, we don't have a true pro-life candidate. Trump has moved much closer to the middle than he was in 2016 and 2020. Trump is now advocating for a 15-week ban on abortions, which is worded a little funny because really what, what it means is within the first 15 weeks of your pregnancy, you are allowed to have an abortion. But after 15 weeks, he believes that abortions should be banned. After 15 weeks, that's great. But the wording's a little funny. It's really not a 15-week ban. It's a 15-week allowance. It's a 15-week allowance. Here's a picture of what a 15-week-old baby looks like. That's not a clump of cells. That's a human being. It's got ears, eyes, a mouth, a nose, arms, hands, fingers, legs, feet, toes. That is a human being. And right now, basically, the CDC states that 95% of all abortions happen within the the first 15 weeks. 95% of all abortions happen within the first 15 weeks. So to advocate for banning abortions only after 15 weeks is not pro-life, church. You're still allowing... 95% of abortions to happen. Basically, you can say Trump is 5% more pro-life than Kamala, who advocates for abortions being legal up until the moment of birth, even in the ninth month. I know they are denying that, but it is on the record, and it has happened. Here in Minnesota, botched abortions, babies who were born still alive We're left to die. The Republican Party as a whole has drastically shifted on the issue of abortion, as has the Democratic Party. But when it comes to this particular issue, the Republican Party today is what the Democrat Party was 30 years ago. It was the Democratic President Bill Clinton who said this. He said, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. That's pretty much what many in the Republican Party today believe. That it should be safe, it should be legal, but it should also be rare. Now obviously the other side is far worse. The Democratic Party believes that abortions should be unrestricted up until the moment of full-term delivery. Church, this is legalized murder. That's what this is. It is legalized murder. They are so pro-abortion, the Democratic Party set up mobile abortion clinics outside of their convention, offering free abortion services. They're not hiding it, church. This is, this is obvious, okay? The Democratic Party is showing where they lie. I heard a great quote that said, those who murder the unborn should not be trusted to govern the born." I agree. So it saddens me to say that this election really truly doesn't have a pro-life candidate, but we must ask ourselves which candidate is more pro-life than the other. And that is clear to see. Which candidate is less pro-abortion? Which candidate will preserve the sanctity of life more than the other? We have the privilege of voting for who is in authority as president of the United States. But if we as Christians don't vote, unrighteousness and wickedness will continue to take over. Jordan, I can have you come up and help me close. I want to tell you what happened in the last election of 2020. The results of that election were only made by thousands of votes. The person who was elected in the last election only won by thousands of votes. The number of Christians that did not vote in the last election was 55 million. 
Can you imagine the landslide victory that could have happened had every Christian voted for biblical issues? It saddens me to say that Christians suck at voting. So please, in this next election, don't sit on the sidelines and say, well, you know what? There's really no perfect candidate. I'm just gonna sit with this one out because it just doesn't really, you know, I can't vote for, for that person because I don't like the personality and I can't vote for that person because we see what has happened the last three and a half years. So I think I'm just gonna sit this one out and not put, not put my vote, not, not cast my ballot. Church, the Christian vote matters. There were 55 million people that had that same thought in 2020. The Christian vote matters, and it is a disgrace that there's that many Christians, that many Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians that don't cast a vote, not for a person, but for policies that person will put in place, the judges that person will put in place, the constitution that that person will either defend or attack. It matters, church. Don't sit on the sidelines. We've got to do our part to prevent the further erosion of our freedoms. Again, getting back to issue number one, which I believe is the most important issue in this election, is the protection of our First Amendment. Our religious liberties are on the line. Your right to practice and live as a practicing Christian who believes the Bible and wants to live according to the Bible, it's under attack. This election truly is, I know this is said so often, but this election is truly the most important election in our country's history because of what is on the line. So we must do our part. You must vote. It is not only your right, it is your responsibility as a Christian. Vote early. In person, person. amen. We must do our part, we must use our influence, and we must use our ballots to prevent our nation from losing the freedoms we've historically enjoyed and to see righteous change happen in our country. We want to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. If you want to make that choice and have that assurance that you're saved and going to heaven, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to be the perfect and final sacrifice for all my sins. Today I choose to live for you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me righteous. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, we'd love to send you a free gift all about your choice to follow Jesus. Simply email us at the link below with your email address. It's time now to give in our tithes and offerings. We want to thank you for your continued faithfulness in your giving. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10 that God provides seed to the sower. So keep sowing that seed and God will keep providing seed to sow. The best way to give is through our Church Center app. If you don't have the app, just pull out your phone, open up your camera, hold it over the QR code on the screen, and then click the link and that will bring you directly to the giving page. Thank you again for sowing those financial seeds. We pray that God bless and multiply your gifts in Jesus' name, amen.